<laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, great to have a full house again. Uh, uh, for and we are uh, very happy to be resuming our uh, ICTS Infosys uh, lectures on string theory jointly with IASC. Uh, and uh, so to to start off uh, the series, it's a delight to have uh, so Samir Murthy from King's College, and uh, he'll be telling us about. Uh, the supersymmetric black holes indices and various phases of ADS CFT. So, Samir. So, the, uh, this is the first lecture. Uh, the next one is uh, tomorrow, I guess, at 3 30. And the uh, third one is on Friday at 3 30 again. And uh, to use, uh, since there are a lot of people joining in on Zoom, uh, please uh, try to either use a hand mic or uh, or press the button on the nearest table mic nearest to you and so that people uh, joining remotely can also hear okay okay thank you very much um it's a pleasure to be back in bengaluru and uh, it's an honor to give these lectures um, my title is supersymmetric black holes superconformal index and phases of ads cft um, and I think many of you, maybe most of you, would have come across these three um, different topics in, you know, in the course of your research or your studies if you're students. Um, and what I would like to do in the course of these three lectures is to try to tell you about some recent developments which bring together these three uh, a priori slightly different topics. Um, so I'm aware that students, I'll try to go at a pedagogical level. It will help me a lot if you ask me questions uh, better in the beginning, as soon as if something is not clear, or if experts want to comment, please, please do so. It's, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Um, also, <laughs> apologies to the mathematicians, I see a few. Uh, I could sort of give a mathematical version of some parts of this, but that's not what the series is. But I'm happy to talk about sort of the more mathematical aspects later or in private. Okay. so. I'll start um, from sort of the basics of these three topics and build it up and then tell you what the relations are. I thought <clears throat> just as an orientation, I'll start with um, a few slides. It'll be like uh, a seminar in the seminar style, essentially for the experts. So if you don't understand everything, it's completely fine. I'll be doing that again. Um, I'll tell you about the problem, uh, the physics problem that motivated these recent developments. Okay, so I'll just jump into it for a few slides and then I'll come back from the beginning. Okay, so the story begins. Um, so the context is the, is the basic ADS CFT correspondence and the, the prototype example of the ADS CFT correspondence. So we want to study some gauge theory and equal to four super angles theory with UN gauge group on a three manifold, which I'll take to be uh, S3 times time. Okay, this will be a running example throughout the lectures. Um, and the dual in terms of ADS CFT is a theory of quantum gravity, in this case, type 2B string theory um, on a space which is asymptotically ADS 5 times S5, whose conformal boundary is the same S3 as the one that the Young-Mills theory lives on. Okay, so here I've sliced this, this S3, um, and the gravitational theory lives in this interior. Okay, just to show you this interior. Um, so otherwise, it's, it's a full, full sphere. And in this interior live all the gravitational fluctuations. Okay, so there can be gravitons, there can be black holes. Um, and in particular, this theory admits black hole solutions, which preserve two of the 32 supercharges of the theory. So again, all, there's a lot of jargon I'll use now. Um, just bear with it if you're not used to it and, and I'll explain everything. Um, and these black holes have um, some, the, the solutions are defined by some parameters. And you can tune the parameters such that the black holes become as large as you want. And in particular, they have a very large um, thermodynamic entropy given by the Bekenstein Hawking formula, area over four, um, which in gauge theory units, if you translate via the ADS CFT correspondence, scales as n squared as n becomes large. N is the rank of the gauge. And the basic question is can we account for this thermodynamic entropy? in terms of a statistical counting of microscopic states. And the natural place to look at is 
the 116 BPS states in the dual Young Mills theory. Okay. And there's a certain observable called the superconformal index, which in a very precise sense that I'll explain counts these states. Okay, so that's called IN. And the Boltzmann equation essentially, so this is like a partition function and the Boltzmann equation say, says that the log of the partition function is like the free energy or like the entropy. And therefore it should agree with the uh, bekenstein hawking entropy. And the basic question is, is this true? Okay, we want to verify this. And this question was posed in this in these beautiful papers. Um, uh, at least one of the authors is in the audience. Um, and recently there have been developments uh, in the last three, four years. It's been a lot of developments um, on this question. Okay, before I go there, I should say that this question is not particular to this only this one system, n equal to four superangles. It's a very general question, um, which applies to any minimally supersymmetric four-dimensional superconform field theory which has some kind of a large end limit and therefore um, some dual uh, ADS dual, okay? In fact, the black hole solutions um, that I described uh, were originally dis uh, discovered in this context, okay? This is a minimal um, supergravity. Uh, this slide, everything is the same as the previous slide, except this number here, the theory now, the minimally supersymmetric theory has eight supercharges and therefore the black hole or the states which preserve two are now one fourth BPS. Okay, that's the only thing that's changed. This is the setting in which I'll discuss because the most general and also the most simple. Okay, so um, yeah, starting from about four years ago, um, there was some uh, bit of breakthroughs. And then uh, since then there's been uh, a lot of developments and, and the goal of my lectures would be to explain the question and explain the answer, which I just posed. Okay, so I want to separate this because um, in setting up the question, I was slightly deliberately um, vague about many things. I said, this is like that and that's like that. And more than half of the time of the lectures will be spent in really trying to make this precise. We want to sharpen these questions. Um, what, what are these black holes? What are the details of these black holes? What is this index? And in particular, I want to spend some time about why there is an expectation that, what well, before that, what precisely is the expectation of equality? And then why do we expect that? And then I'll tell you how um, this problem was solved, okay? And in the course of these developments, um, so this involves many, many people. I'll try to give a few references. Um, we have discovered new things about, uh, firstly about this classical subject of black hole thermodynamics. Um, then that's on the gravitational side. On the yang mills theory side, we have really understood this super conformal index in a much better way, both analytically and algebraically. Um, we can say new things about the operators in super Young mills, which make up the black hole. Okay, a lot is known about n equal to four super Young mills operators in the larger limit. These are operators with fixed dimension with n square being infinite. And here for this black hole problem, the dimensions of the operator also scale as n square. Okay, and so, so it's one of the first, oops, sorry, quantitative places where you have control over these operators. And then there's some mathematics, which I don't think I'll discuss unless there's a lot of pressure. Um, but again, I'm happy to discuss um, this privately. So here's the plan. Um, today, I'll mainly discuss the gravitational side of the story. And the question I want to answer is, what is the precise relation in ADS-CFT between the superconformal index and black hole entropy? So I'll be mainly focusing on the black hole entropy and try to work my way towards the superconformal index. Um, tomorrow, I'll discuss how to extract the black hole growth of states from the index. Um, and then maybe if I have time tomorrow, I'll also discuss um, this other question. So this question of extracting the growth of states naturally leads to this other question, are there other thermodynamic phases? Um, what's the phase diagram, both in, in the gauge theory and in, in gravity? And in the third lecture, I'll try to finish this and then I think I'll have a little bit of time and, and I need some kind of a, either a vote or a, or a veto or something from, from you. Um, I'll, I'll tell the boss to tell me. Um, I don't think I have time to do both. So, so these are two interesting subjects which uh, I could talk about and, and whatever you choose, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that. All right, uh, today I will, so here's the plan of today's lecture. So first I'll review just some classical black hole thermodynamics. So if, if you've been attending your GR courses, advanced GR courses is just basic review, but I just want to set up the formalism 
and um, discuss the Hawking phase transition, and then try to apply that formalism to supersymmetric black holes. There, there are lots of subtleties. So I'll first discuss what the, the black holes are, how to define the thermodynamics as some kind of a limiting procedure, um, and what's the relation to the partition function. And technically, there's some interesting uh, story about constraints that I'll discuss. Okay, so that's the plan. I'll switch to that in the meantime. If you have any questions, uh, either from here, um, I'll join Malla. Um, if you have any questions, now I'm totally confused. I have a question. Yes. So the Witten index is supposed to count the ground state degeneracies of. Of a, of a theory, right? So, is this any, in any way similar to the Witten index? Yes. So, this I will discuss in great detail tomorrow. It's uh, very much similar. It's the, the superconformal index um, is essentially some generalized version of the in Witten index. So, you have trace minus one to the f times some operators which you can put which commute with the supercharge of which the Witten index is an index. Okay. So, it's some kind of general. This I'll discuss in great detail tomorrow. And so it doesn't count ground states of the system, but it counts BPS states. So the same amount of BPS uh, of supersymmetry that the black hole preserves. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a little awkward sitting, but um, my handwriting is not very good. So I didn't want to use the board, especially if I write fast. Okay, so now I begin at the very beginning. Um, so as I said, please interrupt if there are questions. All right. We have what, one and a half hours total roughly? Yeah. Okay, so the story begins uh, in the 70s. So this is something which many of you know, most of you know, um, by the discovery of Bakenstein Hawking, um, which was that any black hole behaves like a thermodynamic object. Okay, in particular, uh, a black hole has entropy, which is given by the area of its event horizon divided by four, in Planck units. Okay, so here's my cartoon of a black hole. I, instead of drawing a, a space time diagram, I'll always draw something like this. This is supposed to be the boundary of space time. And here is the black hole. This is really more suited to the Euclidean description that I will discuss. That's supposed to be the horizon. And here the black hole is labeled by its conserved quantum numbers. Okay, so this is really a black hole in the sense that we understand it, um, some region of space time, which is. Um, um, surrounded by a, a one-way surface called the event horizon. So there's a causal structure, things can go in and nothing can come out. Um, that's why it's black classically. Okay. Now, Bakenstein Hawking found that this black hole has entropy um, and that entropy formula involves the Planck's constant. Um, and so they ask, they said, well, that means that the black hole must be made up of micros microscopic states um, via the Boltzmann equation. So the way we en understand entropy in the rest of physics is that the entropy is log of the number of microscopic states of the system. Um, so the, they've, they've phrased it, maybe I'm paraphrasing, what are the atoms of a black hole? Okay. Or at least can you count how many atoms there are? All right. So that's my first question, which I will focus on. This is sort of our, our um, guiding question. Um, so remember that a black hole is specified by some conserved charges. So I'll be in the microcanonical ensemble. I fix these charges. And the question is, can I calculate the number of microscopic states as a function of these charges? And then if I can do that, that's some gross measure of, of, the, of the entropy, then can I characterize them further? Okay. Now, in string theory, uh, starting from the work of, of Sen and Strominger and Waffer, there's a very detailed picture um, of this, uh, of, of black hole microstates. Okay, which looks like something like this. Um, that here's the black hole with some quantum numbers, and there's some dual picture in string theory. And you ask, what are all the states with the same quantum numbers? And you have some D bands and open strings and closed strings and their fluctuations and their bound states. And this ensemble of states at strong coupling gravitates and becomes the black hole. And then you have to measure uh, the number of microscopic states of this ensemble. Okay, this is a well-defined object in string theory, which depends on the detailed microscopic structure of string theory. Okay, these are the fundamental excitations of string theory. Okay. Today, I don't want to go in this direction. So since Strominger and Waffer in the last, uh, whatever, 30 years, 20 years, 30 years, um, there's been, this picture has been 
developed to, to great detail. And, and, and today we, we really understand this very well. But I don't, I'm not planning to go in this direction. Instead, I want to ask the same question in a much broader setting, namely, uh, given some ADS CFT setting, um, can we broadly understand the microscopic states of the black hole in terms of the, of the CFT, okay, states of the CFT? So it's, it's a much more general um, and broader question. So here's the setting that I, I just showed you there. So here's my gauge theory, some CFT4 on S3 times uh, R. And as I said, this S3 in general can be, um, so this S3 more generally can be a three manifold. Okay, so a lot of details can be changed, uh, but it's good to have one concrete example. So I'll choose this. Um, so that's, that's my gauge, that's my CFT. Typically we think of some gauge theory. And on this side, this is my ADS space. So that's the interior, here are gravitons and that's my black hole. And there's some theory of quantum gravity with, with this uh, boundary condition. So here, this means conformal boundary. Okay. So that's the basic setup. I hope I can assume this in this audience, more or less. If there are questions, this would be a good time. Okay, so then as we all know, um, let me take this example, n equal to four super angles, that's uh, labeled by two parameters, the rank of the gauge group and the Ethoft coupling. And on the uh, gravitational side, there are also two parameters of the theory, the string coupling and the ADS length scale in string units. All right? And these two parameters are, the, the two sets of parameters are related. Uh, lambda is equal to L to the fourth. And um, in, when n is large, the rank is, is very large, uh, we have that uh, there is, and, and when lambda is small, okay, the good description of the physics in, is in terms of the planar diagrams of the angles theory, okay, the, the Ethoft limit. And when lambda is very large, then you have this gravitational description, semi-classical gravitational description in ADS space. Then, then you can switch on the second parameter n. So where here n was infinite. And when one over n becomes non-zero, um, one over n is G string in the string theory. So on the gravitational side, you get quantum corrections, quantum gravitational corrections. Uh, G Newton is one over n square. Uh, and on the gauge theory side, you get the non-planar diagrams. Okay. So today, I'll, uh, today, and I think all three lectures, except maybe the third lecture, I'll, I'll stay in the large n limit. Okay. So it's semi-classical gravity and some planar diagrams. Uh, what is important, what will be important is, is this equation G Newton is one over N square. Okay, the five dimensional G Newton. And the question is, can we identify and count, characterize the black hole microstates, the ADS black hole microstates in the CFT at large N? Okay, this is one of, one of my main goals for supersymmetric black holes. All right. Uh, now there's a comment. <clears throat> it's a technical comment, but important, uh, which is about thermodynamic ensembles. So ADS space, so think of, uh, this is the spatial part and this is your usual cylinder diagram for ADS, okay? If you write the wave function of any particle, you typically find something like this. So in other words, particles are confined to the center of ADS space. Um, and this is popularly, uh, people say, ADS acts like a box. Okay? That just means there's a confining potential. So you can discuss finite energy excitations. These are gravitons, but also black holes. Black holes are also, they obey the same boundary conditions. So they can think of black holes as finite energy, large, but finite energy excitations of ADS, okay? So that means that the natural thermodynamic ensemble is the canonical or grand canonical ensemble. Okay, you fix the chemical potentials. You don't fix energy and charges, but you fix uh, potentials. Um, more technically, you can um, write down, for instance, the, so take a gauge field in ADS and ask, what's the behavior of the gauge field near the boundary of ADS? That's R. Okay, as R goes to infinity, um, how, how does the gauge field behave? And typically there are two solutions to the Maxwell equation, um, one which is dominant and one which is suppressed. And whenever you have ADS uh, three or more, let's say d greater than two, greater than equal to two, um, I mean, the, for d equal to two, there's some subtleties here, but essentially what I'm saying is correct, that this mode is identified 
with the potential of the gauge field and that mode is identified with the charge of the gauge field. Okay, it's like in flat space, you just put a point charge, it goes down as one over R square, and the potential is just constant. Okay, so at infinity, uh, what happens is that the potential mode dominates, and therefore we should fix that and let this fluctuate in the quantum theory. Okay, that's another way to understand why you have the uh, grand canonical answer. Okay, any questions about this? This is slightly important, um, but a simple point. All right, um, now this fact. Uh, that black holes can be understood as finite energy excitations is, you know, this was understood by the masters of black hole thermodynamics. And there's a huge literature starting from Gibbons, Hawking, uh, Page, etc., uh, which developed this subject. Okay. I want to review that uh, to set up some formalism. Uh, sorry, uh, hello. Yes. I have yes. a question. So, here uh, for grand canonical uh, ensemble, you are uh, fixing the potentials, right? So, the potentials here are basically the electrical magnetic potentials of the black hole. Sorry, I didn't hear one word. The potentials are related to what? Ah, both. So, yeah, so magnetic, so good. So, um, so magnetic charges should be fixed always because they're topological. There's some fluxes through, through some internal compact uh, spheres or some, some compact uh, manifolds. They should be fixed. In fact, I'll, you should, I'll mostly discuss black holes with zero magnetic charge. Okay. But it's the electric field that I'm talking about, which is important. This, this, this was a reference to the electric field. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I didn't quite hear the question. So the question was, uh, am I discussing electric or magnetic potentials? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, can you just repeat the question, please? The question is that uh, for the microcanonical ensemble, you fix the charges, right? Uh, yes. Of the black hole. So for grand canonical ensemble, are they still fixed or basically you are fixing the potentials? No, the potentials are fixed. This is like in regular statistical mechanics. So canonical or grand, so I'm, I'm saying, I mean, I, I will never use the word canonical. By canonical, I mean grand canonical. Okay, so in StatMec, we, there's, there's supposed to be three things, micro canonical where all the charges are fixed. Canonical is this funny thing when energy is fixed, but the other, so I'll just, by that, I'm, I just mean grand canonical. So I'm going to fix potentials, let the charges fluctuate. Is that clear? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, want to add that. I mean, in five dimension, probably even this confusion about magnetic charge is not clear. That's right. In five dimensions, the black holes don't even carry magnetic yeah. charges. That's right. So, but my discussion also holds for ADS4 where there's a, th that part is more subtle because the magnetic sort of flux reaches infinity and the boundary mm -hmm. conditions change a little bit. I'm, I may discuss this in lecture three. Already. So there you will actually fix the magnetic charge. Yeah, so it's so a, little more, is a little more, calm. it's a little more subtle than that because that also affects everything. It affects the, the algebra, mm -hmm. um, yeah. When you only at the end you can compare. That's right, that's right, that's right. So most of my discussion will be for zero magnetic charge. Okay, so now I want to kind of uh, give you a small review of black hole thermodynamics. Um, but actually, sorry, so before that, uh, so I'm going to jump successively. So first, let me jump not so many years, but uh, to 98, when Witten wrote this beautiful way where he said, let's revisit black hole thermodynamics in the context of ADS-CFT, okay? Um, so this is the same context that I had. So it's S3 times time, and let's just discuss uh, black holes with only energy, no charge or no angular momentum. So there's only one chemical potential, which is the temperature. Okay, so let's discuss finite temperature black holes, or finite temperature uh, ensembles, um, and equilibrium. Okay. So Loga will be disappointed, but I'll stick to this. Um, so that means that you take time, you go to the imaginary uh, plane, and identify it with some inverse temperature beta. Okay, that's this circle here. Okay, that's the Euclidean geometry in field theory. And in, in gravity also you do the same thing. Asymptotically, you have S3 times S1. And then in the interior, you have whatever. That's a black hole. I don't know if you see it. It's supposed to be there. Okay. Now, in this setting, Witten said, write down the basic uh, equation of ADS-CFT. Okay, so the basic equation is that the partition functions on the two sides are same. All right. So... Now you have these two parameters which I introduced and one more parameter beta on both sides. 
And on the gauge theory side, the partition function is, is of the type that we study in, in StatMec. Okay, it's a trace over the Hilbert space. There's a well-defined Hilbert space of the CFT. You take a trace, e to the minus beta h, that can be expanded in the microcanonical basis. Of D micro is the number of microscopic states. Okay. Now, on the gravitational side, um, the story is completely different. We don't know what is the Hilbert space of quantum gravity. Okay. Uh, that, that's what we're trying to explore. So uh, I should have made a comment here. Um, already when I posed the question, can you find the, the degeneracy of states um, in the theory? Of course, you mean in some correct quantum theory of gravity, which is what we're all after. So instead, we try to turn the question around. If you have some situation where you can calculate this even without full knowledge, that tells us more about the, the quantum theory of gravity. ADS CFT is supposed to give us a definition in principle. And now we want to sort of test it and, and make quantitative calculations. All right. Uh, so here, you don't have the Hilbert space interpretation. Instead, we think of it as a Feynman path integral. Okay, so it means, it, it means that we're going to expand it as some sum over shadows, okay, of exponential of minus the action, which is a function of the shadows, which itself is a function of the parameters. All right. And some shadows we know very well. So we have, for instance, shadows in this case at large n. Large n, remember, means g Newton is small, which means you just solve the equations of motion of the gravitational theory. So that means that you just want solution. So there's the ADS solution, there is the ADS black hole solution, okay, and maybe there are others which we don't know. And here I've introduced a symbol, which I'll make more precise as we go along, probably only tomorrow. Um, for today, we just think of this in the sense of quantum field theory, but anyway, we don't make this very precise. There's some shadows, and you do an expansion. And you hope that when you sum those over, sum over all these shadows and include all the perturbative fluctuations here, you get the full partition function, okay? In the supersymmetric setting, you can actually make this much more precise. I'll, I'll try to do this. Okay, so Witten said, okay, here are these two ways to, to think about it. And now you compare them, they look completely different, both conceptually and calculationally. Um, and when you do that, you, you, you get magical things out of it. So in particular, um, the, the old black hole thermodynamics already had talked about a phase transition. You have this temperature, you change the temperature, then these two um, solutions exchange dominance. And then that means there should be something similar here. And that uh, what it maps to is the quark gluon deconfinement transition. Okay, so it's a very profound um, piece of work. Um, and this will be our template for, for all three lectures. We want to sort of use this kind of, we want to fill this up with more details, with more quantitative um, equation. So in CFT, in principle, you could reformulate this as a path. Definitely, right? But I, I'm saying the other way. So if you really want to find the microstates, you need a Ham Hamiltonian description. So it's the other way. So here we have it. Here we don't. So you, you, you do what you can and try to interpret. So, definitely. So here you, you can. But the usual Feynman prescription, this trace is some path integral. I, I'll use this at the end of today's lecture. Other comments, questions? Okay, so let me just run this example for pure gravity. So this is the action of pure gravity. So five dimensional gravity in asymptotically ADS space, it's the Einstein Hilbert term and negative cosmological constant. This is a Euclidean theory and at some finite temperature. Okay, so let me write an answer for the metric. So it's spherically symmetric. Okay, and in the TR direction, uh, the solution is parameterized by one function, G of R. You can always choose a coordinate system where it looks like this. And some examples we know very well, ADS5 is G of R is one plus R square over L square. And the black hole is G of R is one plus R square over L square minus R naught square over R square. And R naught square is proportional to G Newton times the mass of the black hole. All right. The horizon of the black hole, is given by um, is given by the condition that this function g vanishes. Okay, r plus is the horizon um, that you can either see, you know, if in the in the Lorentzian theory when there's a negative sign, you see that um, just for the Schwarzschild black hole in flat space, it should be familiar. The light cone flips, um, or uh, in the Euclidean ensemble, which is more general, you think of this as follows: that in the Euclidean theory, 
the black hole is, is some cigar like situation where at the horizon um, the time circle shrinks to, to zero. And so this is Euclidean time. Okay. And then you demand smoothness near the tip. Okay. So you demand smoothness. And that implies uh, that you get a temperature out of it. Okay. So that's an exercise for somebody who, who if somebody hasn't done this, has not done this for it is five black holes, do it. It's simple enough. Um, and you get that the temperature is, um, is, is this. It's 2R plus, so 1 over 2 pi L, 2R plus over L plus L over R plus. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. Um, so what does this look like? It looks like this. Let's draw the temperature. So that's R plus over L. That's T. So for large R plus, it looks like this. Okay. And then it comes down. And then for small R plus, it's, it's, it changes direction. And here, it looks like 1 over R plus. Okay. So in particular, that means that there's a minimum temperature. Okay, if you solve that, it, it's at one over square root of two, then you have this. Okay, um, here you see that as, as the temperature increases, the black hole also becomes bigger. So the specific heat is positive. Here, the specific heat is negative. That's a lot like flat space. Okay. Indeed, when R plus, the horizon radius is very small compared to the radius, radius, it's essentially like flat space, so it should behave like that. And you can see the instability over here. Okay. Now, the fact that I'd emphasize that in black hole, sorry, in ADS space, you can properly study canonical ensembles means, must, must mean that somehow this uh, branch should not be present in the canonical ensemble. And another way to ask this question is what happens below T minimum? Okay. And this is uh, answered by this Hawking phase transition. So the fact is that there are these two solutions. This is the black hole. We have a cigar, cigar in the time direction. And the S3 also changes a little bit, but it stays a finite size at the horizon. That's the S3 at the horizon. Okay. It's all Euclidean pictures. And the other metric is pure radius. So here the temperature is fixed and it just stays a constant radius cylinder. And there's an S3 which shrinks smoothly. Okay, so, well, what do we do? We want to compare, we want to ask these solutions dominates, uh, dominates the, the path integral. Okay, so you calculate the action or, or even classically, you ask which is the solution of least action. So you calculate the action. Now the fact that you have pure gravity means that the action of the solution is just, of any solution is just, uh, is just the integral of square root G over the volume. That's a small exercise. And in some sense, this is the volume of space time. Of course, this is not well defined. This is infinite because of the divergence um, uh, towards the boundary of ADS. Okay. Uh, yeah, please, if there are students here, please fill these exercises. If you cannot, then come and talk to me. These are five minute exercises. All right. So the volume of space, the action is really like the volume, but this is infinite. So what do you do? Well, you, 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 you subtract some reference volume and you can just take pure ADS to be the reference itself. Okay, so subtracting that, the pure radius has zero action. And then you can calculate that the action of the black hole has this form. So when R plus is large, you see that the, the black hole, the action of the black hole compared to ADS is negative. Okay, when R plus is much larger than the ADS scale, uh, that means that uh, that's the solution of least action that will dominate. That means that at high temperatures, the black hole dominates. Remember that R plus was large, temperature was large. Um, when R plus hits uh, L, you see that the dominance flips and the ADS uh, solution itself dominates. And that happens is this was one over square root of two. It actually happens before that, uh, before you hit this minimum as it, as it should. So you start coming here and then a new solution uh, picks up. Okay. Another question. Yes, please. So uh, the, could you, yeah. So this IG in general, it would have all sorts of, I mean, if you consider the effective action, I mean, even if you consider the einstein hilbert term, it would con con contain root gr plus uh, root g lambda, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yes. So uh, are you saying that uh, r is to be replaced 
I mean, root gr is to be replaced by root g, but then the gn would get renormalized in some sense. Are you are you taking the renormalized value of gn or something? Um, is your question about the same setup? The the yeah yeah the same pure setup. gravity pure pure gravity ADS gravity yeah yeah. So here uh, r would be proportional to six pi l square. Yeah. That's so. Right. Because because it's it's I mean if you if you simply Maybe R is just R is just proportional to G mu nu right R mu nu is proportional to G mu nu indeed maybe let me just make a comment maybe this will help so are you saying that the constants here which is one over sixteen pi and yeah, yeah. so and one over two is, pi are different is that the comment yeah, yeah 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 so that's a good observation thanks indeed so there's some factor here which which appears okay all right excuse me can I can I also ask a question of course. Uh, I, I would like to I would like to connect this picture which um, uh, whether one or whether black hole already is dominates at which uh, temperatures to these uh, uh, quarks and quark gluon pl plasma uh, transition is it is it possible I mean it seems that uh, when we have quarks uh, at high energy at high temperatures then it must be ADS and if we have mesons at low energy it must be black holes is is it correct uh, or is it the opposite. I, I, I didn't completely understand the question, but I think it's the opposite. Let me just go ahead for a few more slides and then maybe you ask this question again. I think it's okay. referring to something I'm, I'm talking about. I didn't hear the details very well, so that's why I can't answer right now. Okay, just bear with me for a few slides and ask again. I'll, I'll, I'll make a diagram and I'll stop. Uh, maybe I go there and here it is. Um, Is this what you're asking about? Uh, yes, I think so, yes. Yeah, so at, at high temperatures, you have black holes and deconfined plasma. Low temperatures, you have ADS or singlets. I'll, I'll reach there. Okay, so that's that. That's the Hawking phase transition. And now the next piece of formalism that I wanted to review is the last piece of formalism is um, the Gibbons-Hawking Euclidean quantum, uh, Euclidean yeah, quantum semi-classical gravity formalism or black hole thermodynamics in, in the Euclidean formalism. All right, um, and, and the punchline will be that the onshell action is equal to the free energy. Okay, so what's the story? So you have these black holes and we just calculated that it has some entropy which goes as R plus um, to the third power. And then we calculated this regularized onshell action. You can, so this is just the area of the horizon. This is some, this, calculation only knows about the horizon of the black hole. This calculation needs the full embedding of the black hole in the ADS space. And then you can check that the black hole obeys this equation. It's the Lagrange transform of the, of the onshell. The entropy is the Lagrange transform of the onshell action with respect to the energy. Okay. And the energy and temperature are conjugate variables. Okay. So that means that in, in a very precise sense, the on-shell action is like the free energy of the system. And this fact is true for uh, very general ensembles. Okay, so now I will sort of speed up just a little bit. So now I'll discuss rotating charged black holes. Uh, so this is the most general, so it has mass charge and spin. Um, so remember rotating black hole, the, the setup is as follows. At infinity, I have some stationary frame. So there's a killing vector called DDT. Okay. Um, and because it's actually symmetric, there is some space-like vector at infinity called DD phi. And at the horizon of the rotating black hole, um, there's one, both of these are killing vectors. And at the horizon, there's one linear combination which becomes null, that generates the horizon. Okay, the integral curves of that, at the horizon. Uh, so here there's a coefficient, you put the coefficient one and here there's a coefficient, and that is called the angular velocity of the black hole. Okay, so given a black hole solution, you can measure this. And that is the chemical potential for the rotation. Similarly, if you have a charged black hole, you need uh, both metric and a gauge field. So now it's a slightly more general theory. And the electrostatic potential is sort of the you know, component of A along this killing vector and the difference between infinity and the horizon. Okay, that's called the electrostatic potential. And then the observation of Gibbons and Hawking 
is that indeed in this most general situation, the entropy is a Legendre transform of the Onshell action with respect to energy, uh, charge, and angular momentum. Okay, and the these things are conjugate variables, um, uh, pair by pair. Okay, so the bottom line is that ADS gravity, uh, in this very precise sense implements the canonical or grand canonical ensemble of, <clears throat> of thermodynamics, okay? Where the free energy is um, identified with the on-shell action. Okay, so that, um, so any questions about this? That was a review. Am I going too slow or is this okay? I'll speed up after this. This one didn't really need ADS, right? You could have done this in flat spaces also. You could have done it. Um, so there are issues of what exactly the boundary conditions are. Like you want, you know, in ADS, there's a very clear separation between what are sort of normalizable modes and, and there's a gap and there's a plane wave modes. In, in flat space, you'll have to deal with such issues. Yes. So here, yeah. The IR divergences in flat space. Second, don't you have to deal with the IR? Yeah, so that's all. That's that's infinite volume of space, no? so isn't it more tricky? The whole thing? Infinite volume of space, there's also an ADS. So I think no, the, it's, it's the plane regular. waves that are the. Yeah. Let me sit another. Uh, the the entropy of any any that you would compute in any microcanonical ensemble in flat space would always be infinite. Always an infinite number of states at any energy, right? Just because you know you have. Because the loan is the infrared diver. Yeah, okay. So that's, yeah. But you that's can, not true in ADS. In yeah, ADS, there's a finite number of states. Yeah. So there's, yeah. uh, so th this is actually an interesting, maybe deep question, right? Which is when we say the Bekenstein Hopkins entropy is area over four, mm -hmm. what is the set of states that we are counting in flat space? Yeah, I mean, but, but, yeah, but you can, you can put, I mean, I mean, Ashok has answered this in great detail, right? And so you, you can put appropriate boundary conditions to remove this infrared divergence. And then you, the question is, is that the correct one? Is that, you know, is it consistent with the symmetries? So you need to regulate the divergence. Okay. All right, so now you ask what happens in the CFT? And in, CF, in the CFT, the, um, the, you know, if you want to calculate the entropy, if you just want to ask, how does the entropy scale as a function of the temperature? It's very easy. Um, you just count all the, so imagine a gas of photons, just count all the shells in momentum space, add them up, and you find that the energy goes as the fourth power to the temperature of the temperature at, at large temperature. And so uh, the entropy goes as T cube. And if you have a UN gauge theory, if they're N squared photons, um, then you have N squared over beta cube. Okay, now you can compare these two formulas. Okay, so at large temperature and large N, the N squared is one over G Newton and one over one over beta cube is RQ, okay? So we're happy. Uh, this was uh, all part of this observation of Witten, and this brings us to this phase type. So, okay, so in for, just one second. So uh, for at low temperatures, you have ADS plus small fluctuations, um, and the Hawking phase transition takes you to ADS black hole plus small fluctuations. And in the gauge theory side, you have confined singlets, all of, both of these have entropy one, and in the deconfined phase, you have the coagulon plasma with entropy n squared over beta q. Please. In CFT, you are working with small toothed coupling. Yeah, so this is the other side. So this is here I said a free gas of photons, but uh, then if you, so that's a free theory and at small at of coupling, this will get slightly changed. Yeah. So here it, it was a rough thing. There's of course, there's some function of the other parameters coupling. Okay, thanks. Okay, there was a question earlier about this. If it's still not clear, please ask, otherwise I'll move on. <coughs> Any other questions? So can I, can I just follow up? Let's say you try to do this for a small black hole in it. This is on. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Can you speak up? Actually, even I can't hear. Uh, let's say you try to do, do this for a small black hole in it. Yeah. That would be much more challenging. Of course. So that's exactly my, that was my comment here. Over here. So that's the small black hole. Okay. But in the grand canonical ensemble, the, remember, so if you followed my calculations, the, the flip happens at, at one. So it happens before you raise. You know this, very well, of course. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you could yeah. go to the microcanonical ensemble. Yes. And then you could try and ask, you know, uh, be in the regime where you have small black holes. And that would be interesting, right? You, That's right. You don't want to come. And there the boundary conditions and so on are clear. Yes. Because you're an ADS. Yeah. So I have a comment about this, which I don't want to make. I would love to talk about this uh, 
with, with the experts. Yeah. So, so there's some in the supersymmetric context. There's a, there's a sharp comment I have. With this. All right. So then, excuse me. Can I, can I ask a more general question, uh, if possible? I um, I. I'm not an expert in uh, this gauge gravity world, but I heard that uh, for a given solution, which has, uh, which interpolates, for, for example, between ADS and something, one can interpret that as, as a randomization group flow uh, by adding some operator. And if so, I sorry, I didn't hear you. One can interpret that as what? As uh, RG flow. Uh, RG flow uh, by adding an operator. And uh, here, if just looking uh, naively at this black hole in ADS, I can say that uh, far away from black hole, I have ADS. And then can this be seen as RG flow for some theory, sort of starting from young Mills and adding an operator? That's certainly not how I'm thinking about it here. Here I'm thinking about, um, yeah, maybe that question has to do with what's the vacuum of the, what's the dynamic of vacuum of the theory? Maybe that's the kind of question you're asking. Um, I'll just make a comment. I think I will not be able to answer your question. Let me make a comment and if someone else can answer this. My comment is in this setup, the way I'm thinking about it is there's some bunch of states, both in the field theory and in, in the gravity, we, we think there is some quantum gravity and bunch of states. And these are different saddle points. Of, of this ensemble. Now, mm -hmm. to flow between one saddle to the other, yeah, you could think of adding some operator. So, yeah, you could you could sit in one saddle and then you could add some operator which takes you out and takes you to the other the back. Yeah, it's probably that's probably a correct picture, but I'm not an expert and I don't want to. Now, pro pro probably there might exist some very complicated operator that uh, creates uh, quark gluon plasma or what. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's 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 a it's a local operator. Firstly, it's clearly not a local operator. Okay, I it's um, but uh, there are experts in the audience. I don't want to. Uh, no, in the canonical ensemble, you're changing the temperature. temperature. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, as you said, that's it's right. Yeah. So, the same theory. It's certainly the same theory, flowing from one vacuum to the other. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have more to say. Okay. Anyway, so that that's not not a complete nonsense, and that's all, already okay for me. I mean, Can this I picture a is not a complete here? nonsense. Yes, please. Yeah, so I think uh, the point might be that uh, in the ultraviolet, you have this almost free theory where you have this quark gluon plasma. And in the infrared, when you RG flow, when you, when you flow to the infrared, you have these uh, bound states of blue balls and uh, mesons and so on. So the, there might be a connection between RG flow and this picture. That's all I want to say. Yeah, that, that may be true in QCD here. At least in the supersymmetric setting, it's not quite bad because they're both sort okay. of different. Yeah, it's because we don't. So in QCD, it's true that you have you know some quarks at the UV and 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 confined objects in 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 the IR. Here, here we're not talking about sort of lo local operators and and the dynamics of that. You're just asking what's the on some what's the you know you give a temperature or or some lots of energy uniformly to the system. You ask what happens. Okay, so then I move to supersymmetric black holes. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now, um, so supersymmetric black holes um, are extremal, which means that they're zero temperature. And that means that this notion of the cigar that we had, where the Euclidean time circle, that's the Euclidean time circle, shrinks to, to a point at some, um, if you put a cutoff, it happens at some finite uh, distance, is not true anymore. So what happens is if you, if you take a supersymmetric black hole solution, any supersymmetric black hole solution in any theory, and do the Euclidean continuation, you find that uh, there's an infinite throat which is developed. 
Okay, so this, this cap that we had uh, is no longer um, there. All right, oops. Um, and that means that if you measure the volume of the space, okay, something happened. Thank you. I guess I have to share again. There we go, share. Here we are. Um, that means that the, the action is infinite. That's roughly like the volume. And naively you would say that e to the minus the action is zero. Okay. So you could say that supersymmetric black holes does not do not contribute to the path integral. Okay. So this has been a point of, of, of quite some confusion. And um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to resolve this. Um, so, so here I'm trying to list some problems with super, with supersymmetric black holes compared to the usual situation. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that the thermal, which is related, is that thermodynamics is not well defined. Okay, I'll explain this because all the chemical potentials get frozen to some values independent of the charges. Okay, so there's no variational principle. I'll explain this in more detail. And thirdly, there is there's this confusion. Well, if it's supersymmetric, um, what if there is a trace interpretation, what are we calculating? Are you calculating the thermal partition function or some Witten index type of object? Okay, so I want to, all these three points are important for the story. So I want to sort of uh, go through these three points in turn. The first point uh, is true for any supersymmetric black hole. And somehow case by case in string theory and supergravity, we've understood it. Um, in flat space black holes, for instance, Ashok has, has really developed this theory. Um, and in each case, the, the answer is that there's a regulator you have to find. Um, this, is, this is too naive. Many things go wrong. It's like there's a zero and an infinity which cancel. So when you, you have to introduce a regulator consistent with the symmetries, and then take the, the regulator away. And then that's how you define the problem. And then you have to calculate and see what happens. Okay. So that's, that's just to orient you. So now let me tell you the details. Um, so now the context is ADS five gravity in supergravity, minimal supergravity. That means you have eight supercharges. And here's the Lagrangian. It's the Einstein Hilbert. This is the cosmological constant. There's a U1 gauge field um, that has the Maxwell term and a Chern Simons term. And the symmetries of the asymptotic symmetries of ADS five. Uh, so you have the energy, and then on the in the spatial. Uh, section you have uh, SU2 times SU2. So you have these two Cartan generators um, corresponding to the two angular momentum. And okay, the U1 gauge field has its own charge okay, that I'll call R. I'll try to call this R. Sometimes I might call it Q by mistake because I want to keep Q for the supercharge. So please call me out if that happens. And objects like black holes have charges under all these charges, energy, two angular momentum, and the uh, electric charge. All right. Now, this is a super gravity. So this is super symmetry, um, which obeys the following anti-commutation relation. QQ bar, QQ dagger is a combination of these four bosonic symmetries. All right. Now, more generally, there are, so most generally there are super gravity solutions with a horizon, which are not super symmetric. And they carry all four charges. This is the most general black hole solution. So two angular momentum, one energy, one charge. And while writing the supergravity solution, it's a nonlinear problem. One doesn't use the charge, but instead one uses some other parameter, which effectively controls these charges. So there are four parameters, A, B, M, and Q, roughly corresponding to these four parameters. Okay. Now the supersymmetric black hole is completely specified by only two of these parameters, A and B. Okay. So the angular momenta, the charge, the energy, the entropy, everything is fun a function only of A and B. Okay? And I'm going to use this notation star to mean the supersymmetric, the BPS black hole. All right. So just for simplicity, I'll give you, uh, I'll just show you some um, explicit expression. So for simplicity, yes. Notation once again, so you had J1, J2, ER, that's on the-, the So these are the charges. 
Right. So that those are the S3 charges and the R charges and the energy, right? So ADS5 has energy. Very good. The two SU2s. Yes, yes. And the R charge. And now what, what are the right hand side, the MU? Uh, so in supergravity, when you write solutions, um, it's it's actually um, it's always convenient. So the, the natural thing that appears are not the charges, but some parameters in the solutions, which roughly corresponding to correspond to these four. So A B roughly correspond to the angular momentum, M is the energy and Q is the charge. It's a nonlinear, uh, you know how these things work. All right. So, for example, take J1 equal to J2 just to make life simple. Uh, that means that A equals B, and here are the explicit expressions. Okay. So, and this is a this is a property of these solutions, but it's not not obvious, right? You might have thought what there's is, one. The fact solutions are five parameter, but the fact that indeed, indeed. So that's I'm going to explain this. That's so. This is a fact. Okay. First, let me show you the phenomenology, and then I'll, I'll explain that precisely that point. That's an important point. Let me just, since you made it, let me just say it. The, let, let me do it when I do it. Okay. Yes. The analog of this condition in flat space would be zero angular momentum and energy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll do exactly all this. Just give me a few minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll come to this point. All right. But indeed, that's the, it's, so take the Kerr Newman solution um, and impose supersymmetry and regularity, so it cannot rotate. So there's one more. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, so here are the values. So J star, so all of these are functions of A. So now there's only one A. So J1 equals J2 equals J. Okay, so J star, R star, and S entropy. Okay, everything is a function of, of this A. And what I wanted to show is that, um, that the, Angular momentum and the R charge are related. Okay, you can see now both of them are function nonlinear functions of A. You can take one and invert the other, or you can think, just you can eyeball it. You can see what happens when so A is between zero and one, the parameter. You can ask what happens when A is close to zero or A is close to one, and you see that there's some curve. This is an exercise you can put it on a computer, and you can see at least for large J and R. J square goes as R cube. Okay, that you can you should be able to see from here. Okay, think of A being very close to zero or one. You see this. All right. So there's a nonlinear constraint on the charges, on the charges and the spins. Okay, that's the property of these solutions. All right. And note also that if the angular momentum is zero, then A is zero, then everything is zero. Okay. Similarly, if R is zero, A is zero, everything is zero. Okay. So these black holes, supersymmetric black holes must rotate and, sorry, I forgot to write that. They also must be charged. Okay. All right, so now let me address this point that, that was picked up. Oh, sorry, one more thing and then I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah, so, when you start to do thermodynamics, so this was the solution, you just write it down. Now you do the thermodynamics. So thermodynamics according to Gibbons and, and Hawking and I, friends. Uh, uh, they are all, these are all large black holes. Say again, so please. These are all large black holes. They are large black holes, yeah. So you, for the general solution for A uh, not equal to B is also known. Okay. The thermodynamics, you measure it. So beta goes to infinity. That's the fact that this in the Euclidean solution, this thing um, doesn't. Uh, end in the Lorentzian solution, it means that the two horizons come um, uh, sit on top of each other. Now you can measure the angular velocities and the electric potential. And what you find in, is that in the 5D Planck units, they take the following values it's one, one, and three halves. Okay, it's some number, the number is not important at the moment. Um, it will be important later. The moment, the point is that they're fixed numbers, that's not what usually happens. Usually, when you write a black hole solution, you get the potentials to be functions of the charges, and that's what gives you the thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is just some variation of this. Okay, here these are frozen. Okay, so it looks like there's no thermodynamics. All right. So that's the problem. Get the point. So you are saying that there is a unique um, black, extremal black hole solution? I didn't. For all the, so the, it's not at all unique. It's, it's labeled by the charges or by the parameter A and A and B. Okay. But the chemical potentials, when you measure, 
by oh, by the usual I gibbons see. hawking at infinity what you do you say you take you take this uh, killing vector and ask what happens to the horizon you find that the the coefficient is one okay. usually you find it as a function of the the rotation okay all right okay so that's um, so all the details that i'm talking about you'll find in this paper with uh, i should have said um, in the, um, so a lot of this work is my collaboration with alejandro cabo we said davide cassani and dario martelli and there are many other references i'll try to tell them as as we go along the point so far is simply that you have black hole solutions you measure everything uh, like both the charges and the chemical potentials the charges are are here and the chemical potentials are here usually if you do it for let's say a curved black hole you find that the angular momentum is a function of the rotation right? and then you put that into the the extremization so just hold just hold on for 2 minutes I'll, I'll let me tell you my solution and then you can all uh, does this happen yeah. also in flat space flat space i thought it doesn't so okay so that's so let me first yeah where is that sorry i thought ah here uh, let me just come to this okay so i'll come back to what i want to say but let me first discuss this okay uh, unless this was important this was not important okay so let's discuss this thing so take the four dimensional so this is some baby example which i think everybody knows take four dimensional curve newman okay so rotation and angular momentum in flat space 4d means 4d flat space okay what we find um is that the when you write the solution there's one function which has to be positive for the regularity of the solution otherwise you find things like closed time like curves and so on that function is very simple for curve newman it's a function it's m square minus q square minus j square over m square the extremality condition always sits at the edge of this inequality okay so that means that m square equals q square plus j square over m square so extremality means the two horizons the, the two horizons because there's charge and angular momentum the two horizons come on top of each other the supersymmetric condition you can now write a supersymmetric theory with these charges is m equal to q Okay. m equal to q is not the same as f equal to 0 but if you further demand that the solutions are regular which you should then you see that if m equal to q j is forced to be 0 okay this is exactly what ashok was asking all right so the the no i was asking about the chemical potential ah yeah no what you were asking is earlier no what happens is is the same as j equal to 0 No, the, the chemical potential at there, uh, which is the value of the gauge field at infinity, does that get fixed? Uh, in in flat space. Just give me a second. No, in flat space, it's uh, again. I don't want to say. Let me just think about it, and I'll, I'll go back to you. You said that it, it's left the infinite fork. Yeah. That's that is in flat space. Right? Yeah. Uh, just give me a second. So in flat space, the <clears throat> let me just review it. It'll help me. I'll, I'll think aloud. So the way you regularized it is to just forget about infinity and just go to the horizon, and and there you don't worry about the chemical potentials. If you keep the horizon, if you keep infinity, then you have a. If you just take the extremal black hole itself, then I believe it's also frozen. I, I can check this and, and get back to you. If you if you stay in the symptotic flat space and and keep the infinite throat all the way to the UV infinity, then I think that happens. I, I, I'll confirm this. Essentially, that's that's essentially what's going on. Precisely, that's you'll see. That's exactly the solution. Yeah. Right. Sorry, but this is not a general property, right? Because in in ADS three, this doesn't happen. I mean, you have as many supersymmetric states as you have uh, extremal states. Right? I mean, states of black holes. I mean, yeah. So the supersymmetric condition doesn't force, uh, or you know, imposing supersymmetry on black holes doesn't give you one parameter less than what you would have expected, because you said the left hand side e equal to j, and the right hand side. Okay, fine. E let's let's j discuss j. ADS three in a second. Let me just finish this. Um, so of course, ADS three is very special because you have a left moving temperature. But let, let me, I'll discuss that in a second. Okay. 
so what happens here? So what did I want to say? I wanted to make a couple of things. So this is the BPS black hole. Okay. Uh, J equal to zero. But you could just ask what are the solutions? So you could just write the solutions of Einstein's equation without demanding regularity. And you find that there's this whole bunch of solutions. This is the extremal locus, that's the supersymmetric locus. And if you have supersymmetry and not extremality, you find that there's some complex solutions in the Euclidean theory. Okay. The Lorentzian continuations of these are not well defined. Okay. And then further, if you impose regularity, you come to this. Okay, that's the BPS black hole. And <clears throat> so what effectively happens is that there is a two parameter reduction uh, <clears throat> when you for supersymmetric extremal black holes. Okay. C can I just postpone this for, for, for a little bit or is it important? Yeah, we can work it out on the board later. It's it's a yeah. Uh, for the moment, let's 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 just say that. It's generic in the sense, except for a few exceptions, usually this is what happens. There's a two parameter. In the old days, this was something which was always a mystery. Uh, you're saying there's a very simple explanation, which is it's almost as generic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm, if, uh, so it, if I, once I did work it out for radius three, I'm, let, let's do it on the board later. Okay. Yeah. So radius three, exactly. So the super, yeah, yeah. Not so it is no in EDS three. So let's say you work in the NS NS sector. So you have E J. So or your supersymmetry is E equal to E left is J left, and then you can vary E right and J right arbitrarily. So you said the left moving temperature is zero. Sorry, the left moving temperature couples to E left minus J left. So E right, the supersymmetry condition is in the NS sector is that E right minus J right equal to zero. Yeah, exactly. So I was putting on left hand side, but let's put Sorry, it right hand side. Yeah, okay. E right minus J right is equal to zero. Yeah. And then E left and J left are whatever they like. No, not for supersymmetric black holes. So, so there's one more parameter reduction. So let's do this later. In the in the let's say in the D one D five system, yes. it's completely determined by just L naught, just one parameter. So, but uh, you're saying there's one parameter reduction. This I'm confused. I thought I thought in this in ADS three. I mean in Strominger buffer system, you have you have these two charges. As you say, you have the left moving. Yeah, so there's one R charge. Yeah. That's on the sphere. That's on the sphere. But on ADS3, you have L0 and L0 bar. Yes. L0 bar is zero. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah, so supersymmetry in the Ramon Ramon sector would be L0, zero. Yeah, let's say L0, you have L0, L0 bar yeah. and then you have J0 bar, right? But you're saying you don't, you, you don't use J0 bar at all. There's no supersymmetric black hole with non-zero J0 bar. But there are extremal black holes, but no supersymmetric black holes. Is that the statement? Right. Uh, so, do do we want to do this now or, or later? I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, we can do it later. But okay. yeah, this is yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So, what is the 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 point? The point is that uh, if you just impose supersymmetry, that is one parameter reduction, and then if you further impose regularity, you, you get to the extremal black holes. All right, so now let's go back to ADS5. I wanted to say something here. Yeah, so first let's begin with the four parameter family of black holes. Um, this, so there's a four parameter family of large black holes, whoever was asking, non supersymmetric, which is completely explicitly known. All right, so these four parameters, and the horizon is given by some cubic equation. All right, um, and in this family, you can measure the, the angular momenta and the sorry angular velocities and the electric potentials, chemical potentials, and the thermodynamic relations hold as expected. Okay, you, the entropy is the Lagrangian transform of the free energy. Okay, and these two are uh, these are conjugate variables. Okay, it's completely fine. Um, and now, when we put uh, the supersymmetry, there's this subtlety that there's this two-parameter reduction. Okay, so the solution this. Is, is exactly what comes out of this discussion. Um, so let's study ADS5 black holes. So it's the same story. There is an extremality curve and a supersymmetry curve. Extremality says that the two horizons come on top of each other. And the supersymmetry says that um, the one of, so you see that these four parameters, A, B, M, and Q, okay? And they're related in some nonlinear way. 
okay, Q equals M over one plus AB, A plus B, okay? And the, the actual solution, the black hole supersymmetric solution sits at the intersection of these two points where we saw that everything is frozen, right? Now what we have to do, uh, so here, uh, over here, beta is not equal to zero, uh, not equal to infinity. So you can ask, what does the, um, what do the chemical potentials look like over here? Okay, so what we want to do is something supersymmetric. So I want to focus on this. So over here, the Lorentzian black hole solutions have closed time-like curves, they're not well defined, but the Euclidean solution is like this. Okay, it's like a cigar, okay, except that it's complex okay, in the same sense that we saw here. Okay, the parameters become complex. You can take a real slice and you get something like this. All right. Um, and here you can see, you can just calculate omega and phi explicitly, and these are complex. All right, and charge dependent. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. So uh, what is becoming complex? The R is becoming complex. So in this, so let's just discuss this. You just measure the chemical potentials and they're complex. Okay. So, and what are, I mean, what are you setting to real to in order to get the cigar? I'm just saying that to draw this, if everything is complex, I need to take some real slices. This, this diagram, I've chosen some coordinate to, to, to specify what this is, what the circle is. Yeah, so in that, some of the coordinates have to be set to real, right? Yeah, so that's exactly what I said. So there's some real slice that I've taken, which I'm not telling you. Yeah, but how can coordinates become complex? I mean, what, what solution is that coming from? Okay, so it's not that the coordinates become complex. So remember what happens in... in whenever you have rotation, you have something like this. Okay? Okay. Okay, plus stuff. Now, if you do t goes to i t, you get d square is d t e square plus i j d t e d phi plus stuff. Okay. okay. So that's the sense that the metric becomes complex. You can either write it as a met complex metric or you can absorb them in the coordinates, but something is, is, is not real. So okay. if, if I ask you how, if I ask you to draw this metric, Okay, you'll have to make some choice. That's all I meant. But if you yeah. set it, if you set it to real, if you ignore the uh, imaginary part, or didn't you somehow? Uh, Sorry, if I set the full solution, if you if you if you set it, if you set the imaginary part to zero or something, if you make it real. No, no, I'm not setting this imaginary part to zero. I'm just saying. So let me rephrase what I said. I said here is the metric, okay, yeah. and this metric looks like this. If you're happy with that then I'm also happy with it. It's, it, yeah. So usually, you see, usually you don't have this. Okay. Now all I'm saying is that what usually is DTE is now we'll have to choose something like this. Okay. And that's the contractible cycle. Maybe I can explain this to you later in detail later. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. No, so, okay, so that's a good point. Uh, the fact is that, okay, so there is this issue which I just discussed that for any rotation, you always have this, this thing and there's, there's a, here the fact is, um, that's right, you always have that. Here on top of it, um, let me say this, there's no real slice you can take where everything, there's no slice, there's no section you can take where everything is real. Here you can just say, for instance, you know, either absorb that thing in J uh, or you can put it in phi if you want. So here you cannot do this. So there's an additional layer of complex, complex nature. That, that's what I meant. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, so now uh, you don't impose any regularity? Not yet, not yet. So regularity is here. 
Right. Uh, so, so on this horizontal axis, there's no regularity, but then what fixes, for instance, your temperature? Okay. So, well, this is the same question, essentially. It's the, it's, so there's a way to, okay, maybe I, tomorrow I can say this in a little more detail, but basically think of this as, as some Euclidean solution. And then you ask, you find a certain set of code. So at, at infinity, you have something called dt. Okay. Um, and you ask, you, you want it to shrink to zero, you want something to shrink to zero at the horizon, that happens, and you demand smoothness here. But then, uh, but it, yeah. you were not demanding. Uh, okay. ah, sorry, sorry. So there's two notions of regularity. Sorry, sorry, I should explain this. So in the so by when I say here there is no regularity, I mean that in the Lorentzian theory, it's not causally regular. There's a closed time like curve. The solution has to be thrown out. It's not a physical solution. That, that's what it means, like here, for instance. If you just do the Kerr Newman solution, if there's too much rotation, there's a singularity somewhere behind, or there's a closed time like curve. That's the sense in which I meant regularity. What do you, what you do impose is the regularity in the Euclidean section. Sir. Sorry, just to clarify. So you mean in order to calculate, so just to clarify, in, you mean in order to calculate the entropy, you need to take a legendary transform. With I, yeah, so I've not yet come to entropy. So this is still, uh, I'll get there in a second. I see. I'll get there so, a second. But you will take it, eventually you will take in some legendary uh, transformation yes. with respect to this complex. Exactly, exactly. Right? So the main point I'm making is that the, on this line, when you're away from extremality, it looks a lot like the usual variational principle, except for the fact that things become complex. Okay, that, that's the main point I'm making. Right? And in particular, what you find is that beta times one plus omega one plus omega two minus two phi equals to pi i. Okay, you can just measure at this point, what are the various chemical potentials. All right, and you find that they add up to this thing. Now, if you remember, this was exactly the, the combination. You had one, one, and three halves, which became zero at this point. Here it is, at this point. So at this point, beta goes to infinity, and this factor goes to zero. So now, exactly like you were saying, you can extract the first subleading coefficient, okay? Now, you can also ask, I'll do that in a second, you can also ask, um, what is the meaning of this constraint from um, another point of view? So, you have this sort of Euclidean cigar now, and the fact is that it's still supersymmetric. What that means is that you still have a killing spinner equation, okay, obeyed on this metric and the gauge fields. So, you write down the killing spinner equation, and then you do an inner product with this killing vector v, and that is gives you precisely this constraint that I just showed you. Okay, so this is a direct way to see how supersymmetry implies this constraint. Okay, I could have avoided all this discussion. Said that over here you write the solution; it's Euclidean, it's supersymmetric. Write down the killing spinner, and that ask um, what's the um, killing spinner equation, and that gives you this constraint. Okay, but this can be interpreted in some in some nice way. Uh, there's also a gauge field, which depends on R and on a constant. So alpha is a constant here. All right. So that constant is not determined by the equation of motion because it's a constant gauge field. So you fix that constant such that this is smooth in the Euclidean section. Okay, so alpha is fixed, and that implies. So here you say that AR should be zero. That's what smoothness mean, means, because there should be no uh, Dirac string. Okay, you tune alpha like that. And that implies that over here, integral AR is not equal to zero, it's equal to pi times i. Okay. And that means that that's, that's the thing that allows for the killing spinner, so, so killing spinner, to be anti-periodic at infinity, okay? So this comment is, it's, it's, it's because of the following of puzzle, which is sometimes you, people say that on the cigar, you cannot have supersymmetry because if you demand smoothness here, then you get anti-periodicity 
And if you have anti-periodicity, there's no killing spinner because usually supersymmetry means there's a zero mode. Okay. The only thing that happens here is that the Dirac operator also has this extra gauge field. And here there's a gauge field profile such that on this side, it, it enforces smoothness. On, on this side, it's exactly half a unit of translation. It's, it's like a in the covariant derivative, you have a half unit of momentum, which compensates for the geometric anti-periodicity. So that if you actually transport the spinner with this full covariant derivative, it's perfectly supersymmetric. Okay. So you could interpret this as saying that this condition comes from um, you know, demanding that the killing spinner is smooth on the cigar. Okay, yeah. Here, no, no, it's not, it's not zero. AR is also not zero at infinity. That's what you mean. Yes, yes, yes. There's a beta. So indeed, absolutely. Thanks. In the limiting. So remember here, not, we're not yet, we're here now. Nothing is really infinite. So it's large, it's a very small gauge field, but a large um, length, which makes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. So that's what I'm going to do next. That's exactly what I'm going to do next. So you see, so what you do is you take these um, chemical potentials to the BPS values. So this goes to zero, beta goes to infinity, and you keep this fixed. So you take a limit where beta goes to infinity, this omega goes to omega star, such that this, O, small omega is, is fixed and small phi is fixed. And then this constraint equation, you can write in the small variables and you get precisely omega one plus omega two minus two phi is two pi i. That's just a rewriting. And then you can ask what's the action on this, on this cigar geometry and you get this action. Okay, you get something very simple and nice in terms of these rescale chemical potentials. Phi cube divided by omega one, omega two. And note that beta has completely disappeared from from the action in terms of these variables, all right? Therefore, you can calculate the action. If you want to now do thermodynamics, somebody was asking me over there. If you want to do thermodynamics, you can calculate the action here, calculate whatever you want and take a limit. The limit is independent of beta, okay? So that's, that's, that's how you've regularized the problem. All right, so now the last part is, is very simple. You just literally take the Lejeune transform like you were asking. So you take the Lejeune transform with the full potentials, write the full potential as the frozen potential, the BPS value plus the rescale potentials. And there's one part which multiplies beta, but even at some arbitrary beta, this thing just vanishes. So this thing goes out of, out of the room. And here you have some well-defined extremization problem. And this problem, if you take I, this problem, I equals, so if you Lejeune transform this action with respect to the new chemical potentials, under the constraint that they obey, the statement is that you get the black hole entropy. Am I hitting close to one and a half hours? I, I have a little more to, yeah. Okay, that's the statement. Uh, and indeed, if you do this, you get the S black hole is indeed um, what, what you get uh, from measuring the area, okay? This fact that this, this kind of constraint, constraint minimization gives you the black hole entropy was observed in this nice paper, which actually was a big inspiration for us to develop the formalism to, to show why you get this constraint, uh, constraint minimization, okay? So the bottom line is that it follows completely smoothly from usual black hole thermodynamics after this regulation. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's right. So that, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Except the constraints are much easier. Just, just some J equals I or something like this. That's what you get. Mm. Okay. So, uh, okay. Maybe I'll postpone that question. So of course the answer for the entropy is the same. Now, Okay, so again, I've not worked on this myself, but in the near horizon, there is a variety of extremization. So the only physical object is the black hole entropy itself. And when you write an extremization problem, you're effectively going off shell. So there's no rule to how to do it. This is one of them. Um, that's, yeah. But after having two, of course, principles that will always be the same. 
I don't know how to do that. That's a, so. I, yeah, I don't know how to do that. The reason is that if the if you zoom in near horizon, you're throwing away the the infinity. And here we want to do exactly the opposite. You want to keep the infinity and and still keep a horizon. And then take a limit. Some yeah. Okay. So I haven't managed. So that's something I've thought about a little bit, but I haven't managed to do it. Okay. Okay. So I have a question. Yes. Maybe I'm repeating what Ashok just said, but what is this constraint term that you have? What is the constraint? This is the constraint that we just discussed. So it starts by this. You you look here. You just measure it. You just write down the solution, and you find a constraint of this sort. Yeah. And in the rescale chemical potential, that also follows from just the Killing Spinner analysis. Yeah. And then in the you just follow that onto the rescale problem. Rescale variables, and you get the, this constraint. So this action has to be Lejeune transformed with respect to these potentials, but under this constraint. So that's why you have a. Um, uh, this so, so 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 the understanding is that uh, it's essentially zero, right? Sorry, it's essentially what? Zero. Yeah, yeah. So here I'm doing the usual constraint. So you can either solve this. So I'm just saying that the constraint problem you can write. Sorry, I should have written lambda here. Maybe this is what you meant. Right, so you have to extremize. Uh, I thought I wrote that somewhere. The S, I'll just write it here. S black hole equals extremum of the I minus whatever plus omega J plus etc. But extremized with respect to omega F phi and lambda. I'm just saying this is a Legendre, Legendre uh, transform parameter. You have to if you minimize the equation of motion of lambda gives you the constraint and then the rest. Um, give you the the rest, but it's this is more covariant, um, and yeah. So finally, do you end up with SBH equals uh, the term without the constraint or with the constraint? SBH is a function of the charges. Okay. No, okay. I'm just confused by this statement that you're making. SBH equals phi by root three. Yeah. So I'll come to that in a second. Is that more clear? Yeah. So, so that's what I meant. When when it obeys the constraint, the, that term goes to zero, right? Yes. That extra term goes to zero when R J obeys the constraints. Yes. So that's why it's a by four and not something a by four plus something. No, it's not so obvious. You have to solve this problem. Maybe I'll show you how to do it. You have to solve this problem to get this. It's not at all obvious. That if you put this to zero, you get an a by four. No, Let no. me show you. Okay. Fine. All right. Uh, so there are a couple of things I wanted to do. One was to show precisely how this extremization works. Uh, so, so I had a question. Yeah, I'll just tell you what I want to do, and I'll take the question just after. And the other one was just a small recap. So both of them shouldn't. Each of them will take five minutes. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So right now you were looking at ADS. So right now you were looking at this ADS five where you had these four parameters and then you did this analysis. But is there an expectation that uh, this will uh, this type of methodology, the methodology of the calculation, will hold for any dimension? Yeah. So for uh, so ADS three is is slightly different for partly related related to what Subrat was asking, but uh, it also applies. It applies to ADS three, ADS four, ADS five, ADS five, six, seven. Mm, that's after that, there are no black holes, super small black holes. ADS2 is different. So I'll, I'll just answer your question briefly again. It applies to all ADS starting from three onwards, three, four, five, six, seven. Two, it doesn't apply because two enforces the micro canonical ensemble. It's a different problem. Is, this is the one that Ashok had analyzed in great depth. Three is technically different from the rest, but essentially it follows this kind of principles. Thanks. Other questions? I, I can give you references there as well. Yeah. Okay. So then let me first show you this uh, constraint minimization um, because it's it's nice. So let's go back to an even more general problem. Let's go back to an equal force of So now you have. Oh, 
I didn't tell you. So n equal to four super angles, which means you have ADS five times S five. So you have two angular momenta, and then you have a S five instead of just an S one. So you have three. So you have an SU four R symmetry, and therefore there are three R charges. I'll call them Q one, Q two, Q three. One of them is the combination R that I just took in the minimal theory. All right. So now there are chemical potentials omega one, omega two, and delta one, delta two, delta three. Okay, the one we were doing right now is when this thing is replaced. Maybe I say it. Um, this is replaced to phi cube. Okay, you can repeat it in this easier way, in this easier um, uh, case. But I'll actually do this because it's it's not much more difficult. Ah, here it is. So this is what I wanted to write that the black hole entropy. So I'll erase this because that's better written. The black hole entropy. Is the extremum of the Lagrange transform of this action with respect to all the charges and the spins over the chemical potentials? So angular velocities. I said something wrong here. Ah. Omega. Okay, delta omega and phi. Uh, Over the chemical potential, so the angular velocities, the 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 spin, uh, sorry, the angular velocities, the electrostatic potentials, and lambda. Okay, and the constraint is now delta one plus delta two plus delta three. So the the sum of all five adds up to two pi i times one. Okay, I've just written this as n zero for reasons I'll pick up tomorrow. This n zero think of as one. All right. So firstly, i is something simple. Okay, that we already derived for the minimal problem. This is not much difficult. Much more difficult. Notice that this is a homogeneous function. Okay, it's cubic divided by quadratic, and therefore, when you extremize this with respect to either delta or omega, and then put that equation back into the problem, uh, the there's a cancellation here because it's 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 a completely homogeneous function. So, for instance, you have suppose you minimize with respect to delta one, you get an equation like this for q one. Okay, when you plug this back here. You find that this, when you when you do this for all five potentials, the i and this and this all add up to zero. Okay. Therefore, the entropy of the black hole is just lambda, and and this one also all of these also add up to zero. Therefore, it's just lambda times n zero okay, at the extremum. Okay. So I'm, I'm sort of one way to think about it is I'm integrating in lambda and then integrating out everybody else. It just gives a more elegant formulation of the problem. Uh, and this shows that if this constraint were not there, you would get zero entropy. Okay, it's just two pi n zero times some some number. All right. Now you can also take these five equations and multiply them. It's again it's homogeneous. So if you multiply them, you get some cubic equation. Uh, sorry, what you get is that q one plus lambda times the q two q three plus the j one etc. j two. Adds up to zero again as a consequence of homogeneity. Okay, this again is an exercise you can do. Uh, so you have a cubic equation for lambda. So here you have to solve. You have yet to solve for lambda. That can be solved easily. You have an algebraic equation. Okay, write it as p zero, p one, p two, p three. P three is one. And solve. So you have three roots, and the situation is either you have three real roots or one real root and two complex conjugate roots. Now. On top, if you demand that the black hole entropy is real, remember there's an I here. You find that this lambda has to be imaginary. Therefore, this is the situation you must pick. Right? And then again, if you say that the charges have to be real, then this is again some simple algebra. You find uh, that these coefficients p zero and p one and p two are related like this. P zero equals p one p two. That's that's a very easy consequence of these equations. Okay, that equation is precisely a nonlinear constraint between the charges, which is the original nonlinear constraint that we, the black hole had 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 in the in the solution. Okay, which was something difficult, so it follows very simply from this extremization procedure. Okay, and then when you plug that in, you also get the fact that the black hole entropy is what it is. Okay, so that's I just wanted to sketch this. I didn't do the details, but that's that's fun to do. So that was one thing. And yeah, the, this nonlinear constraint was the one which uh, at the yeah. This is the final black hole. Uh, but 
but that, that's where the extremal and the beta. Ah, so that was the comment that this action is independent of beta. So once you've regulated it, you can go. To you can just go somewhere and calculate it, and that's what we did. And it, there's no beta at all, and the answer is is the right answer. So the limit. So you, this is indeed you're right. So this should be. So the charges depend on where you are. But the one, now when you take the beta goes to infinity limit, these charges become the charges of the black hole and you get this. Okay, so I'll end with just a recap of what we've done. So there are a lot of details. Um, the supersymmetric, so the main thing we've done is to embed this problem of supersymmetric black hole entropy. So firstly, we rewrote it as and calculating as a calculation of the ADS on shell action okay, in the classical sense of Gibbons and Hawking um, and, and, and Page. Um, so what that does at a philosophical level is to embed this problem of black hole entropy, the Bekenstein Hawking problem is the micro canonical problem. Is the black hole entropy equals equal to log D micro? It, it changes that into an ADS CFT problem. You have the canonical ensemble, you calculate it in ADS, that's what we just did. And then you calculate in CFT and the answer to the question is, are, are these two equal in some sense? Technically, we converted this nonlinear problem constraint between the charges to a linear constraint between the potentials. All right. Okay. So the thing we're going to focus on now, next, now meaning tomorrow, uh, is this. Okay. This is, you saw, we saw that ZADS um, has at least for the black hole saddle has a simple form. And the question is, can ZCFT reproduce that form? Okay. Now you can ask, I, I just wrote ZCFT, but what does it mean? What is, what is the, what are we actually calculating? Is it supersymmetric or not? Is it, a, what kind of a trace are we calculating? So today I'll tell you the functional integral version. It looks a little slick. Tomorrow I'll do the trace version. So from the book, you had this cigar times an S3. Okay. And smoothness at the tip told you what the boundary condition should be at infinity, both for the gauge fields and uh, well, and for everything. All right. So that tells you that if you then you, if you take this supergravity solution and, and go to the asymptotic limit, you find an S3 times an S1, okay, with some electric potential turned on here uh, around the S1 and the S3 having rotation. So there's some vibration um, having to do with the fact that the black hole is rotating. Okay, these are the angular uh, velocities. So there's a vibration of this and that. Okay, that's, I write it here. So there's a time direction. And then there's a sphere, which is given by theta phi one and phi two. If you don't have this vibration, it's the usual three sphere, but you see that the two angles are fiber. Um, th there's a mixing term between phi one and dt phi and dt, okay? And there's this imaginary part, which is also uh, present. There's this gauge field part, which is also imaginary. All right. There's a killing spinner here in the bulk. So you can also take its limit as R goes to infinity. That gives you a killing spinner on the boundary, which is anti-periodic, okay? And again, I emphasize it's anti-periodic, but it's a, it obeys the killing spinner equation. It's really with the right lead derivative, with the right covariant derivative, you can think of it some zero mode of, of certain operator. So this is a four dimensional supersymmetric background. Okay, it has a killing spinner. So what we are asked to calculate by the ADS CFT correspondence is the Yang-Mills partition function on this background. Okay, it's completely explicit. So that means you take all the fields of the theory, put it on this twisted S3 times S1 twisted by omega. And there's also some background gauge field, calculate the action, and calculate the path integral. Okay, that's what ADS CFT tells you you should do. So this is some supersymmetric path integral. And ADS CFT then tells you that this must be equal to the gravitational path integral. Okay, that's, that's the prediction of ADS CFT, which is what is the gravitational path integral? It's the same, it's the same type of path integral. So supersymmetric path integral over the gravitons and the gravitini with the supergravity um, um, action with the boundary such that the boundary of ADS5 is the same twisted S3 times S1. Okay. 
So the subtle part is actually this, what we did today. Okay, this is a supersymmetric gravitational path integral. And the question is, does the black hole contribute to it? And what we saw today was indeed the answer is yes. Okay. So you could have started from the index and said, just write the supersymmetric index or supersymmetric partition function. That should be equal to some supersymmetric gravitational path integral. And does the black hole contribute? The answer is yes. Okay. And therefore, the, our job now is to calculate this okay, and check that there is a saddle point which gives you exactly the same free energy. Okay, so that, that is what we'll do tomorrow. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
index which looks like this and tau lives in the upper half plane and you can draw some diagram which is in the q plane okay roughly roughly like this okay so that's the upper half plane the disk and in the q plane is the disk okay this is the range of parameters so usually you expect that the the entropy comes from a saddle point because of some singularity at this point it turns out in this problem that's not what happens that's why people missed it but there are two other saddle points and this one is the black hole and gives you exactly this black hole entropy and here there is some sort of sister saddle point which also has the same saddle same entropy and then eventually you'll have to add these and eventually you'll find that in fact there's lots more so that's that's all for tomorrow and the next day Say again. Yeah. There will be cancellation between these, is it? Between this and this? Yeah. No, no, sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is this might confuse you. Not at all. This is the. Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind about time, I can I can tell you. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to do it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do it in detail tomorrow. So that's not a cancellation between index. Those two are some macroscopic saddle points. So any. Quantum gravity problem has many saddle points, and you should add them. Okay, this is like the orbi folds in ADS two. In this problem, what is interesting is that there's some Z two symmetries like parity. There's two macroscopic saddles with the same entropy, but different phases, and those phases depend on the charges. But it's a large n effect. So there's some interference pattern at large n that we will see. It's not it's not some small cancellation of the index. Yeah, that, but from so that's a large cancellation in the sense. Yeah. So the actual index is much smaller than the black hole entropy, right? No, 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 no. That's just wrong. That's not true. So the index counting was not correct. Index counting must have been correct. The the <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I don't want to speak for <laughs> for the authors, but you're right. So I can tell you what was missed. Okay. The count the original counting was written. Okay. So original counting was done in the microcanonical no the no 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 that that's the that's the issue so people i think were not very careful with ensembles that's why i started with with this so this counting was correct okay now suppose i give you a function of this type okay some theta function or something like that and i ask you find d of n so what will you do you'll say well d of n is some dq over q q to the minus n I of uh, tau, right? Q is e to the two pi tau. Okay, so or, or let's write it in the tau language. Okay, it's a, it's it's in some zero to one. The tau uh, e to the minus two pi i n tau. Okay, so now what do you do? You do a saddle point approximation. You ask, I want to estimate this as tau goes to zero when. It turns out that as tau goes to so if this has singular so let's recall what happens in Strominger Waffe. Strominger Waffe, or in the black hole you analyzed, this one goes as two pi i over tau over tau times some number one over twenty four or something. Okay, and then these two play off against each other. Okay, so it, what that means is that as tau goes to zero, this index has a singularity. Yeah. Okay, our friend here does not have a singularity as tau goes to zero. However, notice that in this problem, tau is actually a complex chemical potential. The correct thing to do while minimizing is not tau goes to zero, but imaginary tau goes to zero. So it's equally possible that tau goes to a rational point. And there's a singularity there, and that's exactly what is happening there. I see. And, and that's related to this complex nature, and, and, and it'll all tie, be tied together tomorrow. So if you want, just put it on a computer and try to. Yeah, that's the first thing. I'll, I'll even absolutely. So if you, I might have plots, but I'll just show you. If you let's do micro canonical. Okay, that's just numbers, right? So there's no argument about. Okay, what you find is that you have d of n, you have n, something like that. I mean, I, I should pull it out. Actually, it's it's instead of telling you. So indeed, that's the first thing one should do. How do we do this? Uh, hold on, I don't have. 
I'll just draw it by hand, but tomorrow I'll, I'll surely have it. Okay. Uh, it looks like this, and the black hole entropy curve looks like this. Okay, so really bang on on the nose. Okay. okay. Uh, and but the, the problem is it's it's what you should do is look at this log of this, but it's an absolute value. So there's a phase in, in D of n. So if you do the wrong thing, then you might. I see. Yeah. And then there are these oscillations which are microscopic. So the problem was in evaluating the saddle point. I mean that, that saddle point integral was not correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, Essentially, yeah. yeah. I mean it's not <laughs> it's a subtle problem. Not, yeah, but essentially it comes down to that. Right. I thought they did what count? No? I mean that and they did so they did many count. things, many people did many things. Um, I mean I don't want to say this, especially when Suvrat is not here, but yeah. <laughs> So there's also a large, you can say, well, what happens a large, I'll discuss all this tomorrow. You can say, what is the limit, correct limit? Should it be that the char goes to infinity or n goes to infinity or rank n goes to infinity? And all this was not very clear in the old days. Like, I mean, there was not, I mean, at least I didn't find, I'm sure it was in people's head, but I didn't find a clear statement, calculate this and, and check. Okay, because if you, yeah, if you do that, then yeah. They had matched something to the gas of graviton. Yeah, so there's a lot of. Okay, so another thing you can say is instead of looking at tau, instead of large charge, you can say I'll just I'm just going to take large n directly. This is actually a very hard problem, extremely hard problem, which has still not been solved, um, despite various claims. Um, it's you can so this I n is some matrix model, so you can try to use some old matrix model techniques. There you have to find saddle points of the matrix model. There also there's an issue of what is real and complex and somehow it turns out that the most naive thing you can do just goes wrong. You get some entropy, which is essentially just gravitons. Okay. It also has to do with the sort of complex nature of the, of the thing. But in some sense, Strominger buffer also had this. If you take a rotating black hole in five dimensions, right? Um, and you write the counting function, the, the, the states depend on, on the energy L0 and on J. And the, and the, there what happens is that there's some nice Jacobi structure which just separates it into two modular forms and you can immediately forget about the, the elliptic nature of the problem. But if you didn't know the modular Jacobi property of the, the elliptic nature of the, of the function, you would face similar problems. It's exactly the same thing. The way so well, except unless you take some. Sometimes you can take scalings where you avoid this problem. Yeah. So in that case, you happen to for Fourier, you happen to avoid this problem. You you see a saddle point, which yeah. What about logarithmic corrections? Sorry, what about logarithmic corrections? I mean, uh, the, the, the term that you got was just the area, right? So I suppose tomorrow you'll get from the CFT side, you'll also get the same term, right? Yes. But uh, as is well known, there are logarithmic corrections to the entropy, right? Yes, generally speaking. So how do you, how do you plan to get those from this? The calculation. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, uh, so you, so you'll get them, right? And then the lectures. So no, I'm not going to discuss log corrections at all. So the status is that from the CFT point of view, we have a quite a bit of control. You can say quite a bit. Uh, on the gravitational side, we don't understand very much beyond the the semi classics. But you should you should certainly try try that problem. It's it's not very far out of reach. But I suppose Ashok did calculations where he showed that log corrections matter. Yeah, sorry, I should I should correct myself. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, Leopoldo Pandosayas and, and collaborators have some results about, about log corrections. Yeah, that's right. Which agrees with the CFT. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand it fully, ADS but yeah. It is five. It is five, yeah. It is five. Oh, oh just a tiny thing. It's four, I mean. Uh, um, I, I thought uh, there was some results for ADS4 also, yeah, but uh, maybe maybe there was something. Uh, yeah, this yeah. is probably correct. All right. But ADS5 should be simpler in a sense. 
It is five is simpler, yeah. yeah. Some log n. Even ADS yeah. has more complications. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's important to say what exactly you're, in what limit you're calculating what. Once you do that, there's some things you can calculate, and those things agree. Some question, which yeah, a tiny thing here. You sort of <clears throat> a tiny yeah, just a tiny thing. You sort of like regulated this black hole entropy to get this finite contribution, right? Uh, because naively earlier it was just some like going to zero and sorry i regulated the black hole entropy to get uh, what the action part and you yeah. got this sort of uh, saddle point uh, yes. contribution to the entropy would would you expect to do something similar in the cft side or would it be some sort of a no you don't need a regulator of this sort in the cft so that was exactly my comment here that if you start from here which is what i'll do tomorrow uh, there's a perfectly well defined problem you start with the supersymmetric path integral on CFT, that's some in, you can start with the trace definition, it's an index, it, you can write it as this path integral, by ADS CFT it should be this, and then the question, the subtlety is here. Yeah. Okay. So that's why, that's why I wanted to start with this and clear, after this, once you understand what the limits are, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to get it out of, uh, out of CFT. So there the subtlety is that, like to do the correct algebra, not the analysis is fine, it's easy, but the algebra is, is slightly tricky. Okay, um, so there can be more discussions. Samir is here the whole week. I think he's in A302, he will be from tomorrow onwards uh, in A302 for the rest of this week and feel free to catch him. Uh, and um, so thanks again, Samir, and uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you.